All right. So kind of looking back where we're at and right now and where we started, we talked about some major ethical theories in normative ethics. And I said those two, just, you can split ethical theories into two main uh, categories, ethics of conduct and ethics of character. So remember, ethics of conduct is about examining people's particular motivations and the consequences of their actions sometimes, where ethics of character is about the person's overall character traits and whether you can determine whether what makes a good person or not. So next week, we're going to talk about that, what makes a good person. We're still talking about ethics of conduct, what makes a particular behavior or action the right or wrong thing. So we talk about consequentialism. So if you see on the, on the map there, social contract theory we covered with the Hobbes, utilitarianism we covered last week. And this week we're going to cover deontology. And that's going to be Kant's version of deontology. So he's the one who founded the theory. If you notice, deontology is completely separated from consequentialism. What should tell you, deontology is not about the consequences of your actions. So it's not about the consequences of your actions. What is it about? It's going to be instead, if this thing works. There we go. What it's going to be about is your intentions. So when we talk about the ontology and talk about judging whether something is right or wrong to do, Khan's going to say you have to examine the person's intentions. The actions and the consequences of the action aren't really what you should be examining when you're trying to determine whether something is right or wrong. Does that make sense? So I put this picture up here and I do this every semester. Obviously, somebody got a tattoo of Kant. I would not. <laughs> but I put that up there to give you an idea of how significant this philosopher is and how much he means to people that somebody would get a tattoo. I mean, you have to really take or admire a person to get a tattoo of them in your body. So why Kant is so revered? There's He's revered in this way, I would say. It's common to say that there were five great philosophers of all time. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, which we didn't even quite get to talk about. He's more for my other class in intro. And Kant. So Kant is a German philosopher. Technically, there wasn't a Germany at the time. I want to say German philosopher is Prussia but it's the area what we call Germany now. And he's a very peculiar sort of guy because what he's about is that he wants to make sure that everything is precise. So he's the kind of guy where people set their clocks to him, meaning that he ate breakfast at the same time every day, lunch at the same time every day, dinner, he would walk to church at the same time every day, like he was so regimented. And he's really devoutly religious, extremely religious, but you have to understand he's a deist. I don't remember what a deist is. D-I-E-S-T. We talked about it when we talked about uh, religion. Believes in God. They believe in God, right? 
but what else? There's, there's a there's a condition that he just created the world that he doesn't have to do with any morality. Was it like he, he allows our free will? So he created the universe, but he doesn't come down and influence or change our behaviors. Like he doesn't make me do this or that. Because remember, if God did that, then I wouldn't be really responsible for my actions. Ultimately, you could say, God made me do this or God made me do that. But Kant thinks about this and says, well, wait a minute. How do I deserve to go to heaven or hell if God is making me do this stuff? It wouldn't make any sense. So instead, he's saying, well, he believes in God. God created the universe. But God leaves us our free will. He, he allows us our free will so that the choices that we make in life are our responsibility. And we have to take that responsibility. So we can't blame it on anybody else. So for him, this is going to be really significant for his philosophy. Who is responsible for you then to keep yourself in check? You. You're the only one. So like I said, you can't blame a demon. You can't blame the devil. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame anything. It comes down to you. So he's really strict about that. So this is where we're going to start. If you compare the other theories, the Van Command theory, remember, had one rule to follow. Obey God's command. Whatever the divine said, you do. Whatever the divine said not to do, you don't. Ethical egoism, maximize self-interest. Remember, did you do it for yourself? That was, and you use a contract with social contract theory, that's Hobbes. Utilitarianism, we talked about with Neil as maximizing happiness overall. We do what's best for everyone overall, not just for ourselves. But deontology is going to say act only on universalizable maximum. That's the rule you should follow. But hold on, what does that mean? To act only on universalizable maximum. Can anybody explain what is how you do how do you follow that rule? Anybody have an idea? No one has an idea how you follow that rule. We'll break it down. What does he mean here by act only on universalizable maximums? What does it mean to be universalizable? If I say something is universal, what do, what do I imply about that? Right, that it's general, that everybody must follow it. This is where he's saying that morality is not relative. Remember, we talked about relativism and cultural relatives and subjectivism and what was right or wrong depending on the person and the culture. He's going to reject that. He's going to say the same rules apply for everybody. Whether you like them or not, whether whatever culture or country you're from, doesn't matter. If it's about morality and right and wrong, it applies to you. So he's going to say, act only on universalizable maximums. So you can only do things that are universalizable. And what is universalizable? Your maximum. This is where we're going to get into it. So what he means by maximum goes to the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative, this is like 
perhaps the whole point, the main point of his entire moral theory. He says, act only on that maximum through which it's use. You at the same time will that it should become universal law. So an action is permissible if its maximum can be universalized. That means everyone can consistently act on the maximum in a similar situation. And what he means by you would be willing to let it happen is not an opinion. It means that it has to be logical. So there's a good reason why you should do this. And everybody has the same responsibilities to do this. But I have to remind you, it's not about the consequences of the action. Be careful. So what he is primarily worried about or focused on is he wants, how do you judge whether somebody does the right thing or not? He wants to look at people's integrity. Do they have integrity behind their actions? That's what he's looking at, their motivation. What motivates them to do this or that or not to do this or that? So remember for utilitarianism, they wanted benevolence. To say what you do, whatever will create optimal happiness. But Khan doesn't care about that because that would be based on the consequences. Instead, he's going to say, you should act in a way that you hold and keep your integrity. So he wants people of integrity. That's more important than people who make other people happy. So how do you keep your integrity then? How do you ensure that you, you have your integrity? What does it mean to have integrity? Does anybody have any ideas? Right, there is a level of quality of being honest. So to have strong moral principles, and a principle is a rule that you live by, you have to be willing to stick with that rule. You can't start changing the rule because you feel like it. So he says, I create the maxim which are the principles of my integrity are based on. Notice, you create the rules in the maximum. It's not someone else. It's not an external power. It's not authority. Somebody, your boss, your government, your parents, or somebody telling you what to do. You are telling yourself what to do. How You're telling yourself how to live. So if you really want to be honest, and this is why honesty is a huge deal for him, you're gonna have to be honest, not just with other people, but with yourself. Because as hard as you can, you try, you can't really lie to yourself. So you may give some excuses to other people why you did this or that, but when it really comes down to it, you can't fake to yourself why you really did that. You know why you did what you did. So he's setting a really high standard for people. You can't start bending the rules for yourself at any point. You can't start saying, well, other people have to do this, but I don't have to. Or other people should tell the truth or be honest, but I can lie occasionally. See how if you allow that, you're creating a double standard. You're saying that the rules apply to everybody except you. You're the exception. This is what he thought 
people who lack integrity are those kind of people who make their own rules for themselves and make everybody else live by a different set of rules or expectations. So if you create the maximum, then it's your responsibility. So it shouldn't be based on your desires. This is where he's going to say it's not your opinion what rules you should follow. So we were talking about right now how Kant's philosophy of deontology, his moral philosophy, is one where it shouldn't be based on people's desires. So just because you want to do something or you feel like it's important doesn't justify that you should do it. And that's why it's not going to be based on emotions, which might be really weird for us. And this is where I think a lot of uh, students have difficulty understanding. Kant thinks that morality and right and wrong should be separated from emotions because people use emotions to justify all sorts of things. And say, well, I did this because I was feeling angry or I did this because I was they really got on my nerves or something, whatever. But he thinks all those explanations are bullshit, basically. That you can't start bending the rules because you feel like it. Because it works for you. So that's why he's going to say things like rape, terrorism, torture. These things are wrong, not because they make people feel a certain way. It's not based on people's emotions. Rather, he's going to say, these things are wrong because they don't make sense. They're really irrational. They don't logically make sense the way these things. Which strikes people as weird. But if you start thinking about it for a second, consider it, you'll see that, like, take Terrorism, for, for example, right? Terrorism, we would think it's wrong because you're, you're doing exactly what it says, right? You're creating terror amongst people. You're scaring people. But not everybody will get scared. And the terrorist doesn't feel scared by it. So do you see how if we say, well, don't do things that'll that scare people, well, that's not gonna always work for everybody in every situation. Because everybody feels differently about it. The same thing about torture. People can feel differently about it. Say, well, that person deserved it or whatever. You see how it changes based, if you place morality on desires, it changes based on the person's emotions. They said, well, how can you keep your integrity? How can you make sure that you're consistent and you're a good person if the rules change because people change their mind? That's not a good rational way to set morality and rules based on what people feel and think about it. So it's not based on emotions. Instead, he says that Reason alone is why you should, you should or should not do something. Think about it logically and then you'll see why it was wrong to do this or why it was right to do this. And how do you make sure that you're setting your motivation in the right way, that you have the right motivation? He says it has to come from the goodwill. Now, the goodwill is what he means by that is that. You do it for its own sake. Again, this is where it's maybe a lot different from the other theories we saw. You don't do it because you're going to get something back. That was egoism. But you do it because you see some reward for you. And you wouldn't do it because of the consequences of making people happy. Not everybody might be happy. You do something because it's simply your responsibility to do it. You don't need anything else. 
other than that. This is why for him, this is the only intrinsic value for the real. So, for example, if you have a parent who has the responsible for their children, he would say it's the parent's responsibility for them, whether they like it or not. Maybe the children are terrible. Maybe they annoy them. All that. But it would still be their responsibility. If you say, well, having children makes me happy, it says, do you see why you wouldn't want to place parental responsibility in the form of that happiness? Because then maybe some parents it doesn't make happy. But it shouldn't matter. They should still be responsible for their children, even if they're even if they're miserable about it. So you do it because it's your responsibility and that's it. You don't need another reason to do it. Does everybody follow? So you have you simply do it because you respect moral law. You respect what is right and what is wrong. That's it. Which is, I hope you start to see, is a really high goal he has for people. He wants people who do it because it's the right thing to do, and that's it. They don't need to feel good. They don't need to feel happy about it. They're just the kind of people who are going to do it and be honest about it to themselves even. So they're not going to lie to anybody. They're not going to make up a story to make people happy or make themselves feel happy. They're going to always be honest about what they're doing and why they're doing it. So this is why you wouldn't want to place happiness as a consequence to why you want to, why something is right or wrong. This is why I'm putting these back to back. Utilitarianism, which we covered last week, versus deontology. Because for the two, they're almost opposite of each other in certain ways. In particular, remember I said, deontology is about the intentions, not about the consequences. Utilitarianism is completely about the consequences. But that's, there's a reason why Kant is against putting right and wrong in terms of consequences, because consequences change and cir circumstances change, which we talked about last week. So if you do one thing, and maybe it's the same thing, you donated money or something. Maybe one time it made people happy, and maybe another time it didn't. And so the consequences would change even if you do the same thing. So one time you did something right, the other time you did the same exact thing and now it's wrong. And he would kind of would say, and you don't really have control over the consequences as well. How are you going to justify and say you did the right thing or not if it's based on the consequences, but you can't control what happens? So if I give money to somebody and they use that money for good or for bad, I have no control over that. Once I hand it over the money, it's their free will, it's, it's their control of what's going on for them. I don't have control. So it would be wrong, he would say, to blame me for what they, what they do with the money. Like, why should I take responsibility for what somebody else did with the money I gave? So it can't be on the results. You can't base it on, well, you did the right thing if there's good results or bad results. It's, it's like blaming people for the weather. If it starts raining, I have no control over that. It's not there to blame me for those type of things. So what do I have control over if I don't have control over the consequences? I have control over my intentions. That's the only thing really I have control over is the motivation why I did it, not what happened afterwards. So this is why he's gonna 
say that the principle of universalizability, this is the first principle, which is here. Principle of universalizability is going to say, like we said right now, act only on universalizable maximums. So what a maximum is, is a principle that, of course, you give yourself to live by. And it has two parts, your intentions and your reasons. That's your maximum. So why you did it, and what was your motivation? So you only know your real intentions and, your, and the reasons why you did it. Nobody really else, other than yourself, knows those two things. So you're responsible for those two things. So he's going to say, how do you know you're coming in with the right maximum? You're coming from the goodwill you can test it out for yourself so there's three steps you can formulate your maximum clearly so state what you intend to do and why you can do it that's your reasons and your intentions then second this is where it's a little bit abstract imagine a world in which everybody supports and acts on your maximum so imagine a world where everybody does the same thing for the same reason With the same intentions then ask yourself if everybody at the same time did the same things for the same reason based on the same intentions can the goal of my action why i did this in the first place be possible is it possible to do it? if you run into a contradiction then he's going to say it's wrong because you're giving yourself a set of rules that are not universal, that not everybody can live up to. But if you don't run into a contradiction, then it's fine. Then it's easy. So a good example of this, I think, is a gambler in debt. If I was a gambler and I, let's say I lost a lot of money and I was in debt, and so I come to you and I ask you, can I borrow X amount of money? And I promise you that I'll pay you back. But the truth is, I have no intention of paying you back. Can everybody do that? What would happen if everybody tried to borrow money from each other, but no one had any intention of paying anybody back? Would it be possible to get out of debt? Think about it for a second. Give me an answer. Right, so actually it would be about the trust. Because if everybody is working on the same intentions, right? And everybody knows no one has any intention of paying anybody but each other back. Do you see how you can't really get out of debt? Because no one will let you money. For him, this is proof that's why lying to somebody and making promises you don't intend to keep is wrong. Because if everybody did the same exact thing, you could never actually complete what you intended to do. You're giving yourself one set of rules and everybody else another set of rules to live by. You're saying everybody else has to be honest and pay their debts back and keep their promises except you. Then he said you would be irrational. Why do you 
give yourself that exception. There isn't a good reason to do that. Now, what happens when you have an amoralist, though? Remember, an amoralist is somebody who doesn't care about right or wrong in the sense of falling through. So they sincerely believe that, yeah, they, to them, when they talk to themselves, they're like, okay, I know this is wrong, but I'll do it anyways because, you know, I need the money or whatever. And they more or less would say, well, isn't it rational to promise people you're going to pay them back and not pay them back? If it gets you out of debt, like, isn't that the smart thing to do? Well, there's, good. So there's a reason why. And I want to skip ahead to this. He's going to say that there's two types of imperatives. So an imperative is something that you must do. There's hypothetical imperatives and categorical imperatives. So hypothetical imperatives are things that you do because it will help you get what you want. So if you want money, then it's imperative that you work, go to work. But notice, it sounds like it's completely based on your desires. If you don't feel like you need money, well, then you don't have to work. So whether you want the money or not, you're going to need to go to work or not. So it sounds like a choice, like it's my opinion or it's my uh, decision. But this is why Khan is saying that the amoralist, the person who thinks they should do something or not do something because they feel like it, is thinks morality is a hypothetical character, like it's an opinion or a choice. He's saying that person is confused. It's really a categorical imperative. That all of morality, everything you should do, remember, is based on good reasons to do it, and you should do it from the goodwill, which is you should do it for its own sake and not because you get anything back. You just recognize your responsibility. Regardless of how you feel about it. If you don't like the person, if they annoy you or whatever, you still have to show them respect. So this is why to keep your integrity, to keep the rules the same for everybody, you can start changing the rules because you like somebody or you don't like somebody. So this is how I think most people would expect me to run the class, right? Is that I will, I should grade people across the board based on the same rubric and the same rules. That if I start making exceptions or having favorites, then it wouldn't be fair anymore. And I would have lost my integrity. Because then you'd say, well, what's the point? He's just going to give me this grade because he doesn't like me. Or the other way, right? He's going to give me a good grade because he likes me and I don't have to try as hard. It wouldn't be something that's universalizable, something that a rule that everybody can abide by and it's the same for everybody. So for him, all morality is really categorical. The person who thinks it's an option is just irrational. They're confused. They don't understand what morality is really about. So I want to skip ahead because I'm sure we'll get running out of time again. Chapter 12, and this is where we get to the second principle. So remember two principles. First principle is the principle of universalizability. The second principle is going to be about autonomy and respect. So why, this is from the book, why is slavery wrong? 
Remember, a utilitarian will say, well, if it produces a lot of misery, and it's more misery than happiness, and a lot more people suffer, then it's wrong. But see how it's based on the consequences again, that right and wrong is based on how people feel about it. This is where he would disagree. Why slavery is wrong, according to Kant, is that it's intrinsically wrong in and of itself. It has nothing to do with the consequences. So it's inherently disrespectful, is what he's going to say. Because even, imagine, even if I had a slave, I owned a person, you know, I owned a human being. And let's say I treated them very well, I bought them a beautiful house, I paid for everything, I took care of them completely. What would they not have though, if I gave them anything they wanted? What would they still not have? That their autonomy. Right. Exactly. They wouldn't have their autonomy. They wouldn't have control of their lives. That's why it's disrespectful. That's why it doesn't matter about the consequences. Even if they're happy, they're like, oh, this is a great house. I get everything I want. They, it still doesn't make it right. So how do I make sure that I treat people with respect? This is where we're going to get to the, to the goodwill again and the second principle. The goodwill, remember, says you do it for its own sake. So what he says, it's couldn't, it can't be based on qualities of temperament or just a fortune, which he means it can't be based on what you want, your desires, or gifts of fortune, what you get back. Because you can take any of these qualities, intelligence, wit, courage, wealth, happiness, you can take any of those. But notice you can use those both for good or for bad. I can use my intelligence to help people or I can use my intelligence to take advantage of people. So just having intelligence or just being happy or, or spreading happy or wealth doesn't always, you're not always doing it for the right reasons, for the right intentions. So how do I make sure I'm using my intelligence in the right way. It has to align with the categorical imperative, the goodwill. I do it because that's my responsibility. I'm going to use my intelligence because it's required to help people, and that's my responsibility, whether I like it or not. So the second principle, this is, remember these two principles. Always treat a human being, yourself included, as an end and never as a man. So no one can be treated as an instrument, as a tool to get something else, an end. But he's very particular about what he means by human here. What is this concept of human though? This is always true to human being yourself included as an end and never as a man. What does he mean by human? I mean, does he mean simply psychologically or, or biologically? What, what is he, in what sense is he talking about a human being? You remember what we talked about before? Anything that has autonomy, right? Because it's not that it's a homo sapien. He's not talking about a biological sense. It has to have something that's autonomous. So this is why the golden rule doesn't work. 
he does not respect the golden rule because the golden rule says treat others as you would like to be treated. So what's wrong with that? Why is that not a good rule? Right, because it goes back to what people feel is okay with them, right? So if they say, oh, well, I'm okay with being yelled at, like, does that mean that I should yell at everybody else because I'm okay with it? Or I'm okay with putting a lot of pressure on myself, so I'll treat everybody the same. You see how it's, again, based on your desires, what you feel, and different people are going to have different emotions about what they're okay with. So this is why the golden rule is not a good rule, actually, because you can't really use yourself as a way to measure everybody else. So instead, he's going to say, what makes a human being, what we said right now, and if they're autonomous, because he has two categories for things in the universe, agents and things. Khan is really big in the categories that begin to his philosophy. He loves to categorize everything. But he's going to say, when it comes down to it, you're either an agent in this universe or you're a thing. What's the difference? Agents are autonomous. Things are not. So a thing is like this phone. It doesn't have autonomy. It doesn't control itself. I control it, right? It's a tool. I do whatever I want with it. It doesn't control itself. But I control myself, right? I'm an agent. I determine what I do and what I don't do. I have rules that I give myself. So when he's talking about a human, what he means is an agent, something that's in control of itself. And this is why you can't disrespect yourself as well. This is why he says yourself included. Because if you treat yourself as a tool, then you are losing respect for yourself. You're treating yourself like an object. This is why it's wrong to objectify people, even yourself, is that you are treating yourself or other people as objects when they're not, when they're autonomous. Oops, got the warning again. But that's, we're coming to the end, so it's kind of an issue. But does everybody follow along with that? This is why it's irrational. Think about it for a second. It would be silly to treat this computer like a person, right? It's a thing. It's not a person. It doesn't control itself. Even though I see people do that. They start yelling at their phone or they start yelling at the computer. Oh, it's being difficult. Look, the computer's giving me a hard time. The computer's not giving you a hard time. Your phone's not giving you a hard time. It has no control over what it's doing, right? So you can't really blame something that has no control over itself. But if it's an agent and it does have control over itself, then it can deserve blame. It can stop what it's doing. But you see then, a lot of things are going to be counted out as agents. Because can you say that a small newborn child is an agent? Does it really control itself? And if it's not an agent, it's a thing then, I don't have to show respect. It's like trying to respect my phone. It doesn't really make sense. I would only respect things that can control itself. So imagine if your friend was 
drunk or something. Because there's always that part of people are kids who are too much and they don't take care of them. So take that example. What do you do? How do you treat somebody who's drunk and has lost control of himself and is like making a scene at like Whataburger at two in the morning? What do you treat them like? Whereas, yeah, they're children because they're a thing because they have no control over themselves. You have to take, take control over them. They've lost respect. Notice that too. They don't really deserve respect according to Kant because they're not in control of themselves. So they can't really earn respect because they're a mess. So this is what, this is the bad part of the whole theory. This means that drunk people, children, mentally disabled, Anything that can't control itself doesn't deserve respect. So the rule only applies, the second principle, only applies to things that deserve respect because they can control themselves. Everything else, not an issue. So this would also mean like my dog who just came in earlier. That's a thing. People say, well, what do you mean you can't, like, now you're saying I um, can disrespect animals like my dog? Technically, Kant would agree. He's like, you don't have to respect them because they're not really fully autonomous or control themselves. Like my dog. Which would sound really mean to people, but remember, it's not about emotions. So let's say that this is actually what Kant said about treating animals. He said, I can't say that it's technically wrong morally. It just is that what he thinks is that maybe you wouldn't want to do that. You wouldn't want to mistreat animals because he says it hardens your heart. And that might affect how you treat people who are autonomous. So if you're that kind of person who abuses animals, then you might be that kind of person who abuses that's why he would say, well, maybe you don't want to do that. But is there anything wrong with kicking my dog? According to Kant, no, because it's not really a major thing. I'm only have to respect agents, not things. So that, I would say, is the bad part of the theory. So the last thing I want to talk about is... How do you know you're doing the right thing? There's three types of duties or responsibilities you have. Actions inconsistent with duty, actions consistent with duty, and actions from duty. So actions inconsistent with duty means that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is like your responsibility. Actions consistent with duty is that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, but you're not doing it for the right reasons. And third, actions from duty is that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but you're doing those for the right reasons. This is why he's going to make a distinction. Just because you're doing it and it's your responsibility doesn't make it right, though. So if I gave money to charity, but my intentions were because I just want to get my picture in the paper and I just want people to think I'm a great person, I don't have the right intentions, even though it seems like it's a good action. It's not coming from the right place. So I don't really deserve, deserve respect uh, for that. I only deserve respect and I only have my integrity because I'm doing it for the right reason. And I know, remember it goes back to your maximum. No one else but you really knows your intention. You have to keep yourself in check at all times. And that's why, for God, it's a really high bar to live by. And to be a good person, he never promised that it was going to be an easy thing to do. 
to be a good person is really hard because you have to live and work by that respect every single day. And only you can keep yourself on that path. So I think that sums up Kant's philosophy of morality.